should not handle things that way. That family is furious. Their loved one was shot and killed by a Spokane police officer. Today, they went off on the prosecutor who ruled the shooting justified. Your stories are so far off. We'll see you guys in court. That's all I have to say. See you in court. You guys have no idea what kind of family you're up against. The system is sick. And I'm sorry, you need more training if you can't figure out that's a bat. More training. Disgusting. Cold-hearted disgusting. Tense moments between the Spokane County prosecutor and the family of a man who was killed by police. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Handlerhan. And I'm Jane McCarthy. Today we learn no charges will be filed against the officer involved in that deadly shooting back in January. The family of David Novak, the man who was killed, is not happy about the decision. They voiced their opinions at a news conference today. Crem 2's Amanda Rowley was there. It is my and son. It I, is our loved one. And I, Shame on and, you. And I, I you should you. not handle things that way. What that crime is did wrong. he commit? These are family members of 35-year-old David Novak, the Spokane man who was shot and killed by Officer Brandon Rakin in January. They confronted Spokane County Prosecutor Larry Haskell when he said Officer Rankin was justified in using deadly force. Novak was still armed and therefore posed a continuing danger to officers in the community if he successfully evaded police. The law allows police to make a mistake of fact if it's reasonable. According to Haskell, several police reports say officers responded to Novak's home on West Montgomery, believing he was armed with a shotgun. Rankin heard other officers issue multiple commands to Novak, including Spokane police, get on the ground and drop the gun. Rankin therefore believed Novak was still armed. Police later found Novak dead with a baseball bat, not a shotgun. 11 seconds from when you guys said Spokane to police until you shot my brother. 11 seconds. Who can react in 11 seconds? 50. Novak's sister questioned the level of training the officers receive, knowing the difference between a bat and a shotgun. I'm sorry, you need more training if you can't figure out that's a bat. More training. Disgusting. Novak's mother says she is disgusted. They were not notified about the prosecutor's decision before the press conference today. The only thing we got was about 20 minutes before we got in the car to get here, a body cam of my son being shot. Chief Craig Meidel says the department will now conduct an internal investigation. He says Officer Rankin is back in service and will not be placed on leave during the investigation. A statement from the Novak family says they plan to pursue legal action against the police department. You guys have no idea what kind of family you're up against. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. And after that emotion-filled news conference, we wanted to check into potential next steps in this story. So for later tonight, we are looking at how often officers are justified in Spokane County in deadly shootings, as well as the chances families have generally of winning civil suits in these types of cases. Well, now to the, the new developments in last week's deadly shooting in Spokane Valley. The county medical examiner's office identified the suspect as 37-year-old Colin Osborne. According to autopsy reports, Osborne died as a result of a gunshot wound to the head. Spokane Valley police received a call about the shooting last Friday. Now, the caller said a man was trying to get into his locked business and had a pistol on his hip. A few minutes later, the caller said the man started firing that pistol. Two deputies arrived on scene and a gunfight broke out. Deputies say the suspect, again, that's Colin Osborne, was hit, then got back into his pickup and crashed into a nearby tree. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Nobody else was hurt. As for a motive, it's not entirely clear right now, but the caller said the suspect was his girlfriend's ex-boyfriend. Well, in other news, he's accused of recording underage girls in a Spokane clothing store. When he was caught in the act, two victims, a store employee and a good Samaritan all chased him down. Yeah, they helped hold the suspect until police could arrest him. Krem 2's Brandon Jones is here right now with how store workers describe what happened. Brandon? Yeah, Michaela Kimberly works at HUD 8 and she dropped everything she was doing when she found out the man was taking pictures of girls in the changing room. Her and one of the victims raced out of the store behind him and they weren't going to stop until justice was served. He was sitting right on there, and then all he had to do is reach his hand under here and click. So that's how they ended up seeing his hand. The victim first noticed the man's hand when she dropped her cell phone. When she looked down, she saw him holding a black cell phone with a red light flashing. 
I was just full speed running, chasing him, trying to get him, but I didn't know what was going to happen if I got him. But we had um, three cars going after him, too. We ended up getting cars on both sides because he hid behind a trash can and changed his clothes. But he had his backpack on and we knew exactly what it looked like and we're like, you're trying, you're not going to get away like you're going down for this. Like this is not okay. According to the police report, the youngest victim was only 12 years old. The store only sells women's clothing, but the employees say the man has purchased items from them before, and this was the first time he's caused any problems. The man refused to provide a statement, but he admitted that the backpack and cell phone confiscated were his. Live in the studio, Brandon Jones, Crim2 News. All right, Brandon, thank you very much. Two more Spokane City leaders are calling on Representative Matt Shea to resign. Mayor David Condon and Police Chief Craig Meidel both issued statements. Condon's statement reads in part, when an elected official's personal actions threaten the public trust in our public institutions and foundational principles, it is time for that person to resign. And this is where Representative Shea finds himself. Chief Meidel's statement reads in part, serving others as a voice of the people in line with our Constitution is a privilege that his behavior would seem to indicate he no longer deserves. Shea also made multiple posts to his personal Facebook page today and referenced recent news reports about him. He posted a photo from a fundraiser and part of the caption reads, I may have some of the worst detractors, but I certainly have the best supporters in Washington. In another post, he shared a five minute video he says was made by his supporters and the video features clips of speeches by Shea. Another post he wrote today claims local news outlets did not report on a specific arrest of an Antifa protester in Portland last weekend. All of the recent calls for Shea's expulsion started when the British newspaper The Guardian found Shea had ties to a Stevens County group that offers biblical warfare training. But how common is expulsion from the legislature? Krem 2's Ian Smay looked into that history of expulsions of Washington state politicians. Matt Shea is currently facing calls to resign or be expelled from the Washington State House of Representatives after The Guardian's report that he had supported a group that trains men for so-called biblical warfare. Now, if Shea was expelled from the Washington House, he wouldn't be the first to lose a seat in this way, but he would be only the second expelled from either chamber of the legislature. According to legislative records, the first and only time a member of the Washington State Legislature was expelled came in 1933. Nelson G. Robinson, a representative from the 32nd District in King County, was expelled that year on January 17th, just days into the session. Robinson had been convicted of statutory rape, but was still elected. He was sentenced to time in the state penitentiary, but was pardoned by Governor Roland Hartley. According to those records, after Robinson was sworn in, other representatives from the King County area unanimously recommended Robinson's expulsion. He was then expelled by a vote of 93 to 5. Since then, legislative records indicate that no other representatives or senators have been expelled, but many have resigned or died while in office. Legislative records show 309 total resignations in its history, with some of those coming because a member of the legislature was appointed to a different government position. And as for in-office deaths, 99 are listed in the records. From the studio, I'm Ian Samay, Krem 2 News. We are tracking some breaking news at this hour. Police officers are responding to a shooting in Northwest Spokane. The shooting happened at North Post Street and West Buckeye Avenue. That's just south of Corbin Park. We're going to head live now to a police briefing. Let's listen in. Sure. Let me know when. All right, so yeah, if you could just tell us what we know basic really right now. And so again, all this is very basic preliminary information that we have right now. We haven't been on scene for that long. Um, but after uh, 4.30 today, Spokane Police and Spokane Fire Department responded to the report of a shooting here in the area of Post and Chelan. Uh, upon our arrival, we found uh, one victim with an apparent gunshot wound, and they have been transported to the hospital where they're being treated for their injuries. The extent of their injuries is unknown at this point in time. Um, we are currently on scene collecting evidence and contacting witnesses to find out who all the involved parties are. Um, there have been no arrests made, no one's detained at this point in time. Is there an active search for a suspect? Um, right now, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, do you have any sense of, would there, is there any reason to believe there's any sort of threat to the public? We don't have any information like that right now. Um, however, I, I can't say one way or another because we are so early on in the investigation. If you look behind me, you can see all the officers right now currently collecting evidence, contacting witnesses. Um, so we're doing the best we can to figure out who's involved and where the investigation is going from here. And you said right now you don't know whether the victim's injuries are life threatening. Correct. We don't have an update on their injuries yet. Okay. Do you have any sense of about how long this area of this road is going to be? Um, well, Major Crimes is going to come out and respond to the scene and um, 
start working with the investigation. So I would expect these roads to be closed for at least the next several hours. Listening to a police briefing of an apparent shooting in northwest Spokane, one person taken to the hospital. No word yet on the extent of that person's injuries. This happened just south of Corbin Park at North Post Street and West Buckeye Avenue. So as you heard, it's probably best to avoid this area mm -hmm. for quite some time while the investigation unfolds. As we learn more, we'll be sure to pass it along. In the meantime, we'll move on to weather now. Showers and strong winds about to roll into our area. Tom Sherry tracking all of that. Hi, Tom. Yeah, we could see wind gusts up to about 30. Five uh, miles an hour, maybe see a few showers this evening and overnight, but it should all clear out by Thursday. Uh, you take a look at some of the current temperatures will be cooler than this tomorrow. This time tomorrow uh, again, that's why we call it a cool front. I think we'll see highs only around 80 right now, as you can see pretty much in the mid 80s, and there's a little bit of that rain. We can see it up in Canada and also down in Oregon. There's just a light band or a very thin band of showers. Looks like it's falling apart as it continues to head to the east, but we've got more showers down in northern Oregon that look like they're also tracking up to the north and to the northeast, so possibly hitting the Spokane area as well. But we'll keep an eye on that for you. Could see some blowing dust across the upper Columbia Basin uh, tonight uh, as we get those wind gusts up around 35 miles an hour. We'll look for an overnight low of 5780, the high on Thursday. We'll start out cloudy, become partly cloudy by the afternoon. The weekend looks pretty darn nice. I've got sunshine both days. And with temperatures in the low 80s, I'll check the rest of your seven day forecast coming right up. Thank you.